This is Computer Programming One from the University of Washington. I'm Martin Dickey. Today's topic is one of my favorites, recursion. I might alert you, though, that many beginning students find recursion a little tricky at first. If this is your experience, don't despair. You're in very good company. Take it slow, come back to the early simple examples, and you will get it. In understanding recursion, we'll start by reviewing how function calls work in C. There won't be any new syntax in this lecture. Instead, we'll be learning a new way of thinking. Some concepts and definitions that are applied to this way of thinking include the notion of a base and recursive case. We'll look at a couple of examples in this lecture, and in a later lecture, look at another very interesting one that will remind you a lot of something you've already seen. Let's plunge in with an example that we've seen before when we talked about iteration. It's the factorial function. Now, factorial function can be defined mathematically in a way that's often described as recursive. That is, the function is partly defined in terms of itself. Here's a typical definition of factorial as it might occur in a math textbook. We see that n exclamation point is defined according to two possible cases. It has a value 1 if n is less than or equal to 1. And otherwise, it has a value n times n minus 1 factorial. That's where the recursion comes in. Instead of giving n factorial as some closed formula, we are defining n factorial in terms of itself, in terms of the value of n factorial applied to n minus 1. This happens to be a fairly convenient way and frequent way of defining mathematical functions. It may be surprising that this sort of analysis can be turned directly into a computer program. Let's do that, but first revisit the algorithm we developed for factorial when we studied iteration. Here it is. It's a loop. Inside the loop, each time we multiply our partial answer by the next integer in the sequence. The integers start from 1, and they continue. Uh, uh, sorry, the integers start from n. We're counting down and they continue as long as i is greater than 1, as long as i is greater than 1. We'll continue. As soon as i reaches 1, we stop. Now, we could stop when i uh, reaches 0, but multiplying by 1 has no effect on the answer, so we save a small step by not multiplying by 1. At this point, we have the result in the variable product, and we can return it to the caller. Using the mathematical definition, which involves recursion, we can rewrite this function in a way that directly mirrors the mathematical formula. Look at this with me. The function header stays the same. Same parameter, same return type. In the function, I first make a comparison for n less than or equal to 1 and in that case, immediately compute an answer of 1. Otherwise, I compute the answer by taking n times the factorial of n minus 1. At the end of the function, I return the result computed by one of these two methods. This exactly mirrors a mathematical definition. And if you're not sure why, please go back and compare the two, and you'll see that the recursive structure is preserved in this computer program. Let's trace this a little bit informally at first, and I'll come back in a minute and do it with some more uh, detail. Let's say we want to compute the factorial of 4. Okay. Well, looking at this function, if 4 is n, that is not less than or equal to 1. So my next step will be to compute n, which is 4, times the factorial of n minus 1, which is 3. So I've converted my formula into 
something that I expect to give the same answer but has a different parameter in it. Now I'm calling the factorial function again. This time the parameter is 3. Inside the function this time, I'll be breaking it into 3 times factorial of 3 minus 1 or 2. Eventually I'll have to multiply this by the 4 that was there from the previous step. What about factorial of 2? Well, it's 2 times factorial of 1. And we continue, but not forever, because factorial of 1 gives us the case n less than or equal to 1 and gives an immediate result of 1. So now I have this product, 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. The last part of the product is done first. 2 times 1 is 2. 3 times 2 is 6. And finally, 4 times 6 is our final answer of 24. This actually works. If you're not convinced, you might take this, type it into your compiler and run it and see what you get. Why does it work, though? It might at first seem mysterious that one function can be doing, apparently, several things at the same time. Understanding why it works doesn't require any new syntax. In fact, no new concepts of C. It merely requires applying definitions that we've already seen. These apply to functions that don't have recursions as well as functions which do have recursion. And we'll take our definition of a recursive function to be one like we've seen, one that calls itself. Let's see why this is true. Remember the steps involved when we call a function in C. At the time the call is made, that is while the program is executing, the system will allocate space for that function's parameters and local variables. It's important to remember that this, this does not happen in advance. It happens at the very moment a function is called. The parameters are initialized, and then the function begins execution. Recursive functions work in exactly the same way. The key is that every time I call the function recursively, I get a brand new set of parameters and local variables. That's because, as with all function calls, those parameters and local variables do not get allocated until the very moment that the function is called. With this in mind, let's go back and review our trace in slightly more detail, looking under the skin of the system a little bit to the variables in memory. In main, I'll have a variable k to hold the result of the calculation. It's initially unknown. And in fact, it's still unknown at the time I make the first call to factorial, which has a parameter of 4. Let's jump up and look at the, the function factorial. It has a parameter of n, initialized to 4 in this case, and a local variable whose result is unknown at this point. What's going to happen? Well, we'll first check the condition. Is n 4 less than 1? The answer is no. So we'll do the else part of this condition. That says assign a result, the va value of n times factorial of n minus 1. Now before we go on, just another reminder of something we learned a long time ago, how the assignment statement works. You always evaluate the right-hand side totally and completely before doing the assignment to the left-hand variable. So result is going to remain uninitialized while I try to compute n times factorial n minus 1. This involves making a call to factorial. Okay? And at this point in the execution, we open up as it were a brand new copy of factorial. Allocate space for n and for result. Notice that this space is completely separate from the memory variables in the first version of factorial. You could think of it as two separate copies, and it is two different locations in memory. The system will keep track of this, even though the names are the same from the program text. In this copy of factorial, n is 3. It had the value of the previous n minus 1. 
Result is still undefined. We'll make this check. Is n less than or equal to 1? Well, no, it's not. And so we'll start to evaluate the assignment statement. Result gets n times factorial n minus 1, which is now n minus 1 is 2. We have to call factorial again, and a brand new, completely separate set of locals is created. n will be 2. Result is still uninitialized. Once again, because result is not less than or equal to 1, we'll do the else part. This will cause us to call factorial of n minus 1, which is 1. And this time, something different happens at last. Okay. By the way, you always want to have an at last when you have a recursive function. If the recursion never ended, you would be in something as bad as an infinite loop. You'd be in an infinite recursion. So here we have our at last. Something other than that recursive call is going to happen. That something other is n is less than or equal to 1, and so we say result gets 1. And now we're at the end of this function at last. All of the other calls to factorial are not at their end yet. They're hung in abeyance on an assignment statement. But this copy is done. What happens when we hit the return result statement of this function? Well, poof, it goes away. But as, as if we're waving a goodbye kiss, it sends back the value 1 to its caller. Where does that go? Okay. It would be rash to say that that 1 is stored in the variable result. It's not. That 1 is just the value of the expression factorial n minus 1. So we will combine that by saying n times that result, n times 1, 2 times 1, and that's what result is a 2. Now this copy of factorial has ended. It does a return result, and poof, it's gone, but it kisses the 2 back to the factorial that called it. Okay. Now we're ready to complete the assignment statement in this copy by taking 3 times 2, putting that in the 6. We're going to return that result. Poof, we send back a 6. 4 times 6, stored in result. And now we're about to return. Poof, that one's gone. The 24 is sent back, this time not to another copy of factorial, but to main itself. So we've now completed the evaluation of factorial sub 4. And the assignment statement k gets factorial of 4 can finally be completed storing the 24 into the variable k of main. OK. <laughs> That's how it works. And it really does work. And as I promised, it doesn't involve any new concepts. It simply uh, avo avoids having to invent a new concept to make this function work. We're using what we already know about parameters and the way they are passed in C. Let's put a little bit of terminology to this before we leave the subject for now. In the example we just saw, we did something quite different in the case where n was less than or equal to 1 than in the other case. In the first case, the function terminated shortly after making that comparison. In the second case, we continued with a recursive call. This leads to the idea that there have to be two different kinds of activities in a recursive function. There will always be a recursive case where the rec function calls itself. Without this, we wouldn't call it a recursive function. And actually, there might be a number of different recursive cases. There must also be a base case that returns a result more directly, that is, without having to call the function itself. If there are no base cases, then the recursion would go on indefinitely. There has to be at least one base case for the recursion to end eventually. And there has to be at least one recursive case, or else we would not consider it a recursive function. There's a further requirement on the recursive case that's a little more subtle. And that is that the recursive case must, in some sense, make progress toward a base case. Now, this is a little harder to pin down. But the idea is that if we kept calling recursively, 
we might never get to the base case even though one was coded in the program. So the recursive case has to somehow get us closer to a base case. Forgetting one of these rules or forgetting to check it is a cause of errors with recursion. Let's look at uh, the application of this terminology in the program we just saw. The if n less than or equal to 1 signals a base case. And the else of that signals a recursive case. Why don't we turn to another example and apply what we've seen to uh, this one to try to determine whether or not the function terminates. Here's the function. We informally call it the 3 times x or the 3 times n function. Let's look at it together. The function returns a 1 if its argument is a 1. Otherwise, we have this check x mod 2 equals 0. Now, this might seem like a strange expression, but it's just the programming or the mathematical way of seeing whether x is even or odd. Okay. If a number is 0 mod 2, that means it's divisible by 2, and so it's even. And in the case that the number is even, the value of the function returns is 1 plus the function applied to that value over 2. Okay. We'll take the argument, divide it in half, and pass it recursively to the function. Otherwise, we're going to return 1 plus a recursive call to 3 times that argument plus 1. Okay. That would be the case where x is odd. So here's a question. Is there a base case? Yes, clearly there is a base case. Does that mean we can assume that the function will eventually terminate? We can't really assume that. We have to analyze the recursive case to see if it makes progress. And it's a little bit hard to determine simply by looking at this. If the number is even, we're making it smaller, so it seems as if we divide by 2 enough times, we ought to get down to 1. So we definitely make progress in that case. But if the number is odd, we multiply it by 3 and add 1 to it. That makes it larger. It seems like there we're getting away from 1. We're getting to a larger number instead of a smaller one. So the question would be, do we eventually get to a number that divides down into 1, even though along the way I might at some point make the number larger? Okay. What's the answer? Surprising answer is that nobody knows. Computer theorists have been puzzling over this for years. And they have been unable to prove mathematically that we'll always get to the base case. Well, you might test your hypothesis by coding this up and trying it with lots of values. And people have done that, too. The trouble is that we can't test every single possible value that might exist in the universe of numbers with a test. Computers are finite, and they only have so many bits used for representing integers. So it, with all the tests that people have run so far, the answer has been yes. It always gets down to a base case. But is there some big number out there we haven't discovered yet that might lead it not to? Well, if you can find the answer to that, you might be on your way to a PhD in computer science. To help understand this a little better, let's trace a couple of these just mathematically without stepping through all the parameters and local variables. Let's take f sub 5 to, as a first example. Now, the function asks, is this even or odd? It's, it's an odd number. So the answer returned will be 1 plus 3 times the number plus 1, or 1 plus f of 16. Okay. Continue. What about f of 16? That's an even number. So its value is 1 plus f of 8. We combine the two ones and have 2 plus f of 8. f of 8 is even, so... We're going to get 1 plus f of 4, so 2 plus that would be 3 plus f of 4. And now, if you recognize that 4 is a power of 2, you'll see that we're going to divide down to 1 fairly quickly. f of 4 gives f of 2, and finally, 5 of f plus f of 1. Now, even though 1's an odd number, it's the base case. 
So we're not going to multiply it by 3 and add 1. We re simply return a 1, and that gives us a 6. So in the case of number 5, f of 5 is 6. Okay. We take another one. Uh, we took 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, about 6 steps to get to a base case with 5. I wonder how many steps it will take with 7. Okay. We'll apply the same uh, sequence of operations, and I won't go through them all in detail. Let's just get started with it. 7 is odd, so the first uh, breakdown will be 1 plus f of 22. f of 22 is even, so this will be 2 plus f11 at the next step. We keep doing this, and you might want to check this at home to make sure I have no errors on the slide. Gee whiz, the number goes up, and then it goes down, and then it goes up again. Finally, we reach a number 16 that's a power of 2, and at that point, we'll always get an even number when we divide by 2, and we'll get down to 17. Interesting thing is that even though 7 is only 2 greater than 5, it took us a whole lot more steps this time. And in fact, if you try this at home, don't try a number that's very large, unless it happens to be power of 2. If you pick the wrong number, this could go on for many steps, and by many, I mean maybe perhaps hundreds of steps or thousands, many, many steps. Very interesting and unsolved uh, puzzle. Let's step back and, and think about what we've seen so far. When should we use recursion? You may think that we have a choice because the first example we saw, factorial, can be done either iteratively or recursively. And you're right. We often do have a choice. Uh, sometimes we don't want to use a complicated algorithm when simple, something simple and elegant will do. If the problem itself seems to be defined in terms of recursion, then the natural way to express it in the program may be with recursion. We will continue this topic in uh, in more detail uh, later in the course. Today we've seen the basic concepts that in that recursion involves functions which call themselves. A key concept in constructing a recursive function is to have both one or more base cases and one or more recursive cases, and the recursive cases need to get closer to a base case eventually. The examples we saw included factorial and this mysterious 3n plus 1 function. It's an important concept with many uses, but sometimes a little tricky one. Don't feel bad if you don't catch on to recursion right away. Take your time, and eventually you'll, you'll find that it's a useful programming tool.